Okay, uh, welcome all uh, to this uh, continual learning course uh, we are offering at the University of Pisa in conjunction with uh, Continual AI and the AI Doctoral Academy. Uh, I'm very excited to start with you this journey today and um, we will start today with, uh, with an introduction of the course, uh, what continual learning is, um, how we're going to go through the course in terms of modality, uh, what kind of exam it would ask you to do to, to, to have an official certificate and all answer all your questions about uh, the structure, the content and the modality of the course. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here, first of all, and the people that will be attending remotely. Uh, and I guess uh, we can start. Um, OK, I want to to really uh, thank the, the guys at Continual AI that um, helped uh, me uh, during the organization and the development of the material. Uh, so the idea of this course was to uh, start by creating an, an open access, let's say, uh, series of lectures that would we, we could um, maintain and develop even collaborative in the future so that we can um, let's say may continue learning a bit more of a, of a mainstream topic for uh, machine learning and, and AI research. Um, so uh, in case we're interested in uh, these topics and the contents uh, that we're going to address during this course, please don't hesitate to visit continuai.org. This is a, a non-profit research organization I'm uh, likely to be part of. And so um, uh, many of the content and materials that have been created is actually using part of these uh, open source um, code software and projects that we are actually developing within Continual AI. Uh, so um, uh, just check it out and uh, why not uh, you can become also a member of the organization. Uh, so another um, mention uh, quickly notice that I want to give in this course is that uh, while uh, this idea of machines that can learn continually is something that can be traced back in time since the very, I think, uh, birth of uh, computer science um, and AI. Well, um, in this course, we're going to address the latest development of continual learning machines, mostly focused within recent deep learning literature. Um, so um, excuse my brevity in some, um, you know, content and, and uh, explanations and ideas if I limit myself to just the realm of deep learning. Uh, of course, there are many interesting uh, projects and investigations that have been carried out uh, in, in the past and, and different uh, sub areas of machine learning and, and AI. So uh, it, and it's maybe up to you uh, in that case to, to link uh, to uh, these endeavors and I will provide some um, links uh, over the course. But again, the, the, the main focus will be on deep neural networks. OK, so um, uh, my name is Vincent Salomon. OK, I'm an assistant junior assistant professor here at the University of Pisa, and I'm also the co-founding president of Continual AI, the organization I mentioned before. Uh, I'm going to be the main structure for this course. Uh, and um, uh, I'm also I, I'm, I'm also lucky to be part of the board of directors of AI for People, which is instead an, another nonprofit organization that is more concerned on the idea of building AI systems uh, for the benefit of humanity. So design and develop AI systems that can be centered around people. And uh, I want just to mention this because it's uh, it's um, now AI, AI for People is now uh, addressing and, and uh, organizing a conference on AI for social good. Uh, so if you are interested in these topics as well, please check out uh, the, the efforts of this organization and uh, join the conference that is happening right now. Um, then uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, um, uh, we have a couple of uh, teaching assistants for the course as well that are doing like amazing voluntary job here. Uh, here you can see Andrea Cosu. And uh, also, I wanted you to introduce Antonio Carta, uh, that is a postdoc at the University of Pisa, and he is a, an expert on continual learning and the connections with distributed learning. Uh, so we're going to hear from him also an interesting um, introduction uh, about this uh, topic um, and these areas, sub areas, say, of continual learning in the frontiers, I say, of, of continual learning we're going to see uh, in the last lecture. Um, then, uh, as, I mentioned, as I was mentioning before, Andrea Cosi is, is, is another very talented PhD student uh, at the Scuola Normale Superiore at the University of Pisa that is also working on continual learning, but more at the intersection with sequence learning. So working with sequences, temporal 
uh, correlated patterns of data and how these can be seen, uh, let's say, uh, can be explored at the intersection, because uh, this is an orthogonal, let's say, paradigm with respect to continual learning. But we're going to hear about him as well, so uh, don't worry uh, if you don't get uh, already this connection. Okay, so what we are going to do today, so we're going to go through a brief, not so brief description of the core structure and modality uh, that we taught for this year. And again, please, uh, sorry in case there are some misunderstandings or problems related to the course. This is the first year that we are offering this course. Uh, so uh, any feedback is also very much appreciated. Um, then we are going to go through an introduction to continual learning. So what continual learning is, how we can define it a bit better, maybe a bit more formally, even though, as you may know, continual learning is something very uh, novel and not well consolidated in terms especially of formalism. So uh, there may be art patches that we're going to go through this course. Don't, I mean, take my um, insights and, and ideas with a grain of salt. Uh, that there, there is no like a, a single unifying, let's say, formal for continual learning and all the ideas related to this course. So this is a very on the cutting edge uh, research and exploration. So take it, take them as, as it is and, and, and build your own ideas based on this material. Um, so then, then we are going to discuss today what's the main relationship with respect of other learning paradigms that have somehow shared concepts and have investigated uh, concepts that are interesting for continual learning, at least as it is defined today. And uh, this will be accompanied by a brief history of continual learning machines, just to, uh, with a couple of slides, to identify relevant milestones that I believe are important for, the, for developing the vision and concepts related to machines that can learn continually over time, like humans do. Um, but first of all, let's start about uh, talking about you. <laughs> so um, I received more than 400 uh, registrations, enrollments for the course online and, and in presence. Uh, I'm really excited actually to, to see all of you here in presence. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a nice plus and it really is stimulating us in producing better material and, and, and better course overall. Um, but um, so, uh, among a sample of these more than 400 uh, enrollments, I just uh, took the, the first uh, 338 here. Um, uh, we, we have actually 30% of PhD students and 48% and, um, of graduate students, uh, a bit of postdoc, and then a mixture of, of everything. Uh, but this course is, is tailored to be a PhD graduate, let's say PhD course, so a graduate student course. Um, and, and uh, especially targeting people that are actually enrolled in a PhD. Uh, so I think many of you are, I, I notice a lot of, of friendly faces here, so that's great. Uh, and uh, so if for the other people that are joining this course, uh, pretty much all the content would be understandable and I think it would provide valuable insights. But uh, remember that this is a PhD graduate course and, and we assume a couple of, of, uh, of prerequisites we're gonna discuss now. And so, um, here in the enrollment uh, questionnaire, I ask about the basic uh, background knowledge that you have because uh, for really getting uh, out of this course the, the best value, um, you need to have a basic computer science, machine learning and deep learning knowledge background. Because uh, we are going to assume uh, many concepts over time uh, that are related to these three, let's say, main areas, if you can call them that. Uh, and and so uh, a basic continual learning knowledge is not required, so you can just be starting from scratch. But we assume that you have a bit of knowledge about machine learning and deep learning. Again. And uh, then here you can see the chosen, let's say, preferred modality for attending the course. Ninety-five percent of the people uh, enrolled uh, decided for um, uh, remote participation, and the, uh, around thirty people here uh, decided for to to attend in person. Uh, you can stick to, to the preferred modality. Uh, I already sent to all of you a detail about how to join depending on your uh, decisions and you can mix those. I mean, you can stay a bit online, a bit offline. Um, but what, what's important is that uh, we're going to talk about the certificates at the end, but um, in the certificates, I just announced this because uh, someone asked, uh, we will have the notion inside it about how many lectures you actually attended, right? So. 
for, for the people online, uh, I, I can get that from the Microsoft Teams uh, receipts. So let's say they can download. For the people here, I just, uh, um, let's say, uh, try to, to gather uh, your, your participation, uh, uh, recognizing you here, and uh, I'm not going to take uh, signatures, right? So, so let's uh, stick with that. With, uh, with that. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of course, modality and structure, uh, first of all, the objectives. So that the objectives of this course, given that we have just 16 hours together, is to just provide you with the fundamental, basic, theoretical and practical knowledge that will enable you to start exploring uh, more advanced topics uh, in continual learning. So it's just the basic building blocks that will help you to, uh, let's say, learn faster about the particular piece of knowledge that you want. So um, this is the main goal and of course, letting you apply such skills, uh, basic building blocks of knowledge to your own research problems. Because I, I know that many of you are interested in, instead of, let's say, working purely on continued learning, you're interested in applying this knowledge to your own uh, research area with your own research agenda as you are a PhD student that is supposed to, to work on, on, a, on, let's say, very original and custom uh, research thesis. Uh, so that this is pretty much the, uh, cut of, of, of these uh, these um, uh, course and the objectives. Uh, then, uh, in terms of modality, uh, we're going to stick to this uh, room if we can get uh, roughly this uh, amount of participation, uh, or we can move to a bigger room. Uh, that, that's uh, that was something that we we were a bit uh, hesitant uh, to to do today. Uh, it's still unclear, but in case I will notify you through the appropriate channel uh, if. You uh, you can uh, you can you can come here and uh, we figure it out no problem but in, in general for the basic announcements and all the let's say um, um, uh, let's say formal uh, communications you can refer to the official website so don't send an email to me just check before on the on the course since you're 400 you 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 get why <laughs> uh, you just check on the website uh, and uh, and you will find there a pop up or something telling uh, everything that changed uh, over time. Okay, uh, then difficulty we discussed about this graduate PhD students would, would it be perfect. Um, and then in terms of lecture plan, we will follow this idea of having two lectures every every week, uh, Monday and Wednesday at the same time. So at four uh, CET, this Italian time, uh, we we meet each other again. Uh, and the period will be from the 22 today to the 20 of, of December. So eight lectures plus uh, an invited, let's say, guest lecture at the end that will uh, finish the 20 of December. Language will be English for the course, so please stick to that, even though we are many Italians. Uh, and uh, you can, of course, interact with me, interrupt me at any time. <laughs> and I will ask sometimes questions to you, uh, but you can interrupt me freely. Uh, and I will... Uh, uh, ask uh, here, for example, Andrea to, to gather questions from the online participation in case there are, and I will try to answer them uh, in case Andrea cannot address them directly in the chat. Okay, again, the official course website is course.continualai.org, so you can take that as the main reference for all the information related to the course. Okay, let's get to the cheese for many of you that wants, uh, wants really to, to have at the end of the course, not just the knowledge and the skills, but also certification uh, and, and um, that is somehow confirming your ability to, to, do, to pass uh, even an exam. Uh, so I, uh, for, for the sake of, of um, uh, well, the officiality of it, but also for the time and, and in the efforts, I cannot give certificates to everyone, but just for the people that will actually uh, they intend to, to, to follow the course, course through and to have a final exam after it. Uh, so for those people, no problem. We have relaxed time uh, in a sense that you can send me an email when you have figured out your exam. You're sure that you, have, you want to follow all the course or maybe you have already followed the entirety of the course. You get an idea around what you want to do for exam. You contact me through emails, no problem, and we can decide a time in which you can discuss about the project or maybe uh, directly look at the at what we have produced and, and get an evaluation of it. Hmm? And then you get, of course, a certificate with uh, the, the amount of lectures you attended, because uh, I know that for many of you, it may be useful to have uh, like a formal certification of attendance in terms of hours. 
that are translated also in, uh, in credits. And uh, in terms of proficiency, I can tell in a, in a single certificate that you actually were able to pass the exam. OK, uh, then what the exam can be about. So here I just list a couple of options for you, but I, I'm not I'm not a, like a, a fixed um, constrained uh, mind about this. So you, you're freely to explore also alternatives, reasonable alternatives. Uh, what I wanted to suggest you here is just a couple of, of things that I think would be enough to showcase that you actually got uh, the main content of the course. So you are now, uh, let's say, more independent in working within this area or applying this knowledge to your own problem. So uh, first example may be to create a Google notebook, a Google, I mean, uh, a Python notebook, a Google Colab notebook showcasing an interesting continual learning exploration, maybe anything, an idea, uh, an algorithm in particular, or uh, anything that would somehow show that uh, continual learning is, 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 is an interesting thing. <laughs> so um, uh, for, for the sake of it, uh, I think the best way to um, get a, 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 a um, um, let's say a reasonable evaluation would be to open directly a PR, this is a pull request, so that you show me also that you have these technical abilities to do things um, and uh, and to open it, for example, in this continual I call a project, which is a collaborative project in which we collect uh, all the notebooks related to continual learning that other people can enjoy. So you would also, let's say, benefit the community out of, of this exam if you want. Of course, if you don't want to, to, to publish it, we can just have it offline. But that's a, um, a possible uh, idea. Uh, another interesting and um, um, thing to showcase your, your um, expertise in continual learning would be to implement a continual learning algorithm and reproduce basic results uh, um, with it. So you, you don't have to write an original uh, uh, continual learning algorithm, but, but you may start with from a paper uh, that is already explaining an algorithm that they're testing it and, and, and giving well, let's say the results and try to reproduce those results uh, so that you you're sure that you understood the paper you wrote the the algorithm down it is working as expected right and then you bring this uh, possibly to this other uh, continual ai project that is the reproducible cl endeavor where we try to reproduce results from a community in which it is very very difficult to reproduce results <laughs> so uh um, given given the different explorations, assumptions, and and uh, somehow not a uniform uh, formalism nor uh, code base, uh, we'll discuss about this later. Then another option would be to add instead a feature to uh, um, um, I think one of the, the, the best projects that we came out uh, out of uh, continual AI, which is Avalanche, it is an end-to-end an -end library for continual learning that is based on PyTorch. And so the idea would be to add any feature to this tool uh, that would, I think, prove that you have uh, knowledge about how continual learning is developed and implemented in a complex software repository and show me that uh, you can build something else, something more, something original. So showcase, showcase that you really understood that, that, that that's a relevant need for the community and you want to integrate this, know, this knowledge into our, our common uh, uh, knowledge base, in this case, a software repository. And uh, pay attention, this is also very important for a PhD student because you need to, to be able to say something more about what's really existing already but you also to need to conform to the other, uh, let's say, needs and expectation from a larger community. So you need to communicate uh, originality and new ideas, but also be able to communicate with the same means of the rest of the, the same communication means and language of the rest of the community. And then uh, a fourth option that I list here is to just uh, write a custom, let's say, uh, application of continual learning in your own realm. I don't know, you are uh, maybe a PhD student working in bioinformatics, okay? Then you notice that something can be nicely tackled by continual learning uh, research and development algorithms. Then uh, you decide that that's a project you wouldn't you'd like to tackle. You just uh, create uh, your own repository and you start working on that and you showcase something. You don't need to solve an entire problem, but you showcase that you can apply what you learn is in this course in another realm, possibly even with some originality with respect to what's already existing. Okay, so um, 
of course, for any question related to the to the course, you can contact me at my official email, vincenzo.lomonaco at unip.it. With this, uh, let's say, CL course, please use this so that I can uh, automatically classify the emails uh, related to the course. So use this tag in the subject. Okay. Um, what else? So I think this is a good time to ask if you have some questions related to the certificates and to the exams. In the meanwhile, I will take a sip of water. <laughs> Okay, that's that's great. Uh, I was clear enough. Uh, anyone from the uh, remote? Okay, that's that's great. <laughs> that's great. Okay, perfect. So um, just to stress the prerequisites of of the course. Um, uh, so we we are gonna use uh, during the course um, um, Python, uh, Anaconda, possibly as uh, let's say the, the the way in which we install. Uh, let's say uh, OS agnostic, let's say um, environment for Python. Then uh, I don't know if you're going to use PyCharm, but I invite you to have uh, like a, a local setup where you have PyCharm as your main IDE uh, to, to work on the code. Well, this is just a suggestion. You can use your preferred one. Um, then, but that you, have, you need to, to be able to work with Python, you know, swiftly. Huh? And uh, I invite you to check out the Jupyter Python or Google Colab uh, notebooks if you if you don't have already that notion that will be e e useful because from the next lecture we're going to start using those. Um, and uh, you you need a, to have as we we also mentioned in the exam uh, requirements uh, to to have a basic notion of Git and uh, GitHub possibly. So that that's that's something that uh, you should already have. Uh, if you have a basic knowledge of uh, of, uh, of um, computer science, and um, uh, also that this would be a plus, um, important plus, having a knowledge, uh, reasonably working knowledge of PyTorch, which is one of the main, if not, I guess now we can say the main <laughs> reference deep learning uh, framework for research uh, in deep learning. So. Um, these are the, the main requirements um, in terms of especially tools, I would say. Then you need to have absolutely a, a basic knowledge of machine learning. So if you don't have this, please take your time and, and do uh, maybe before, if you can, squeeze it, uh, a machine learning course, even on Coursera, the, the famous Andrew Junger uh, course is, is what I, I suggest always. We're going to use also some examples taken from, from the course and, and try to bring those examples into the CL realm. Um, OK, uh, so setup and tools, uh, nothing more than Microsoft Teams, uh, so, uh, working on a content and Python uh, uh, setting, uh, possibly uh, already a Google account. Virtually, we, we, we assume that all of you have a Google account if, if you want to use Google Collaborate. Uh, and then I say this, but it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, the Jupyter, let's say, project online was, was taken down uh, by the fact that it was, I think, included within the Google Collaborative uh, um, um, workspace. But, but yes, that's another um, um, problem. And um, uh, of course, uh, try to install PyTorch and uh, have a working PyTorch. Maybe the latest version is stable version is, is best uh, so that you can start working from the next lecture right away. And, and I invite you all to, to bring your laptops, even though you are uh, following in uh, in um, in, in person here and uh, maybe useful. OK, so in terms of the, the content of. Chancellor, there yep. is a question yep. online. If the project can be developed uh, by a group of students, mm. it must be an individual one. Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would prefer an individual one uh, because that way I can uh, really link the, the effort to the specific person because uh, not that I, that I think that is not uh, valuable, actually. Um, you know, together we can build better things and tackle bigger problems. But um, the problem is that I don't think I have the bandwidth to actually uh, have um, a meeting, an oral, let's say, exam in which I can assess the knowledge of each of the participants. So I would prefer not if uh, that, that's that's my that then I can make exceptions, but it should be really something that you, you really want to do for a specific reason. So I don't know, you, you have a very interesting project would, would uh, change the future of continual learning. Then in that case, <laughs> I think that uh, we can make an exception. Okay, so the, the class timetable. So we're gonna have eight lectures, as I mentioned before. 
that you can see here. And uh, the last one is going to be a, um, a guest lectures. I, I think that it, that's absolutely important that you attend that lecture uh, as well. Uh, I think that you can uh, see from the uh, from the knowledge that uh, Guido and Gada, <laughs> these two uh, invited uh, guests, will, will bring not only new uh, interesting ideas for the future of CL, but also uh, see how young uh, researchers such as Guido and Gada uh, uh, are able to make a dent, I think, in, in, the, in the impactful, let's say, research in the context of continuity learning just after a, 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 an handful of, of years uh, of research. So I think that that's a really something uh, that uh, could, could stimulate you as well, right? As young uh, PhD students and researchers to 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 uh, work on exciting research topics and 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 uh, feel uh, you know uh, that uh, that nice uh, feeling of really uh, building something that was was not there before, right? Um, uh, okay, so let's uh, see very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the content of each of those, those lectures as just a heads up and, and then of course we will uh, tackle them uh, more in depth uh, in, in each uh, of the different lectures. Okay, so we're going to start this, um, um, we're going to have this lecture uh, after these, uh, the first uh, structure and modality course that is going to address, as we mentioned, the uh, continual learning, just the basic um, introduction and uh, the relations with other partings and a brief history of continual learning. We mentioned already this, so I guess we can skip it. Uh, then the second lecture will be about mostly about understanding catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so what is catastrophic forgetting or interference? Uh, this is judged. Uh, uh, I think this is a shared view as one of the main obstacles to continual learning, especially with deep neural networks. So we're gonna get. Uh, a deep, let's say, understanding of what, about this main problem that is often mentioned in continual learning, but is not really addressed in terms of, of, of uh, trying to really explain it in depth. And so we are going to focus on the entire lecture of this because I think it's uh, it's interesting and fundamental. And uh, this will help us to have even a more practical hands on experience on, on uh, you know, on on, on continual learning, uh, but, but mostly for the people that are a bit of a, of a weaker, I'd say, background in machine learning, uh, you know, be sure that they can follow up uh, in the rest of the course. So this is going to be uh, all about uh, also an introduction, let's say, to to, to continual learning and uh, the the practices around it and the uh, and the actual tools that you you're going to use in this course. Uh, so we're going to have two practical sessions uh, even uh, in this in this uh, lecture. Um, so the first one will be understanding forgetting with just one neuron. Uh, so I try to 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 limit, let's say, the the um, expressivity of a particular promise to study uh, really forgetting uh, the, 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 the the very core of it, not just as a result of a complex interaction that we cannot understand. Oh, so we're going to focus on a problem where we have one neuron that is a linear regression problem, and uh, we are going to see how uh, continual, uh, sorry, a catastrophic forgetting can emerge simply even with uh, with a simple uh, linear regression. Um, um, then we're going to see instead a uh, more deep learning example using the standard MNIST data set that I guess you already uh, uh, have seen in your, your experience, many of you at least. Uh, and uh, we're going to start exploring uh, two uh, very common actually benchmarks used for continual learning that are permuted MNIST and split MNIST. And finally, we will have a, a, an introduction and I'd say an, even an end zone, I think, introduction on Avalanche. This, this tool, an end to end library for continual learning, is, I think, we can judge uh, uh, as, as the, one of the reference libraries for continual learning today. Uh, OK, then uh, after this lecture about the problems, let's say, of continual learning, the main problem of continual learning, can strive for getting, then uh, we will we, we need uh, to define maybe more carefully and with a bit of attention and reasoning uh, what we mean by 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 benchmarks uh, in continual learning, how we can assess, uh, let's say, our methodologies uh, in, in particular scenarios um, in, in which we think that continual learning may bring an advantage or uh, we may constrain continual learning so that it's easier to, to work uh, with it. Uh, 
but but in the end we need to define uh, with a set of constraints set of assumptions what we mean uh, by uh, a continuous learning scenario uh, that would describe even possibly relevant uh, use cases right uh, so we're, we then are, are going to uh, pose an accent of what's existing out there so and the common benchmarks that are used in literature so that you get uh, more of a broader idea on, on what's what's the current focus of research what are the next uh, research directions some of benchmarks and, and and you what you could expect uh, in the in the near term or long term future and then I want to to hear your thoughts about this as well of course because <laughs> uh, because uh, I think that's an open question uh, that we need to address together um, so as we will all often do uh, during these lectures the last part of the lecture is going to be dedicated to an end-on session in which we bring the knowledge we have developed in the first part into practical terms and uh, we try to do that within the scope of avalanche because avalanche is really this end-to-end -end framework that would allow you to explore and investigate prototype new ideas and you'll see that it's so flexible that uh, it, it is indeed uh, an useful tool that we can explore together in the entirety uh, among across the entirety of the course so that's great uh, and of course, we are all invited to already start uh, looking into the documentation of Avalanche and uh, and everything related to it. I think uh, that's something you can really do. Uh, and again, uh, please, sorry uh, if you encounter some problems. Uh, it's still a uh, actual library that is in a alpha version, so in very early stages. Uh, we need your patience here and, and sorry about any possible uh, problems that may arise. There may be our patches. Um, then uh, another important lecture after the introduction of the data and how we can process this stream of data we see at the core of the definition of continual learning we're going to explore uh, more uh, in depth what we mean by evaluating an algorithm so how we can evaluate an algorithm in continual learning since it is uh, i can already anticipate this to you very different from the static and classic machine learning way of evaluating a system so this may be challenging and, and, uh, and debatable even i guess uh, so i think we can have a very nice brainstorm about this but for sure what we need is a different evaluation protocol uh, and start thinking about uh, different ways we can evaluate these very different uh, ways of learning uh, so then apart from the evaluation protocol that define these different assumptions and rules that we put in place to evaluate the pro uh, an algorithm uh, then we need to focus on the metrics. So what's important to measure in continuous learning? Can we just stick to accuracy or these metrics often used in classification problems, for example, or we need to address something more? We need to consider uh, uh, additional, let's say, um, dimension of the problem. And I think that's the case. So we're gonna see uh, how uh, continuous learning is actually pushing towards a better, more comprehensive defini definition of machine learning systems that uh, are indeed evaluated even on a more, uh, let's say, on efficiency and scalability dimension. I think it's fundamental even for our notion of sustainable AI uh, development. Uh, and of course, we're going to conclude this lecture as well with, uh, uh, let's say, a focus session on avalanche metrics and loggers even that will help you to monitor your experiments over time uh, with the uh, tools that you can, you, maybe you already know, like TensorBoard or 1DB, so tools that would, uh, would uh, give you a uh, nice window and access to what's happening under the hood. I think this is fundamental, not just for continual learning, but for everything that you're doing in machine learning. So we need to look more into the black box, right? We cannot just look at the metrics results and uh, just stick with them and, and to, to build, let's say, our assumptions based on those results. We need to look into the, into the black box and try to understand the inner functionings of these algorithms and, uh, and uh, what's happening behind under the hood. Uh, then uh, another part of uh, important part of the course will be open by uh, this section on methodology. So we're going to focus uh, three different lectures on methodologies because I think it's it's the, the core uh, interesting aspects, right? Apart apart from these formalism, metrics, ideas, vision, the course is very important. I think that the, something that you can really bring home after this course will be. Uh, a brief introduction to the methodologies that have been developed as mostly as heuristics uh, to address catastrophic forgetting and start thinking about machines that can learn continually within, of course, the realm of deep learning, gradient-based architectures. Uh, 
Um, so we're going to start with the first lecture about, uh, uh, let's say, starting to, 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 to make a bit of sense out of it. So after uh, a lot of different investigations and uh, directional explorations in general, uh, I think we can start to think of different categorization of these strategies so that we can get maybe a better idea on how to frame these and to see each of those methodologies. Uh, so I think that this categorization is still an open debate, <laughs> as you may imagine, but I think that we can already start uh, looking uh, at, at a more, let's say, shared vision about this, and we will discuss about this. Uh, other than, uh, let's say, uh, let's say how we arrived to this situation with a bit of a, a notion of history and timeline that brought us here. And this is, is also, I think it's, it's something that is often discarded in machine learning, but in, even in research in general, as uh, uh, and, and I think you should you should deserve more more attention. So this idea of uh, seeing knowledge not just as as an end result, right, uh, that you can study on a book, but try to link that to people and to communities and to history. Uh, so events, milestones, that actually condition a whole line of thinking uh, in a particular direction. So this is fundamental. Uh, to understand even at the, 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 the PhD level, right? Uh, maybe in the PhD level, that uh, it, it's not about knowledge. It, it's about uh, how uh, um, the vision is evolving over time. It is it's, it's fundamental also to bring your own results uh, and vision and make it work within this particular trend. So you need to understand this to 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 build on top of these of these that is built collaborative uh, across the world. So this is very important. Well, uh, but apart from that, um, in the first um, lecture, we're going to focus on the most, I would say, effective strategies for continual learning that are called replay strategies, with this idea of somehow uh, gathering a bit of more of examples from the past and re knowledge from them. Uh, so replay somehow the knowledge uh, and re uh, our knowledge based on those uh, representative examples. And uh, we're going to focus on, on this, let's say, first category and uh, look as always and, and how you can build this in avalanche with a quite a, of a more of a focus on uh, this very nice idea and, uh, and, and approach. I, I should thank Antonio for this. He's now the principal maintainer of avalanche. It came up with this very I think a uh, neat and clear way of uh, building algorithms in continual learning based on plugins and callbacks. Uh, so you, essentially the idea here, we'll talk about this in details, is that you can build, uh, build a strategy and combine it with other strategies with the notion of plugins. Uh, so that's already something that um, uh, 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 makes, me, makes me wonder. I mean, uh, and, uh, I, I really like uh, this idea uh, of um, uh, of the compositionality of strategies that we we'll see it sometimes it's possible and and, and uh, even beneficial. Um, then a second lecture on methodologies will be about regularization strategies. So this idea of regularizing learning over time uh, and um, uh, make sure that we do not forget mostly about the past or we are more able to um, uh, let's say. Um, use the previously acquired knowledge for learning future tasks and, 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 uh, and uh, from future examples faster. Uh, and then we will focus on a third categorical, let's say, um, opportunity that is architectural strategies. Um, of course, for each of those, we will discuss the main ideas, but also some representative uh, specific strategies that uh, that are we will be discussed more in details. Um, and, um, and 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 with, with these category of strategies, the main idea would be to uh, find ways to modify the topology of your uh, mapping function, your parametric function, so that uh, you can learn uh, with, with all these nice properties continually. And finally, we will see about uh, the implementations of the aforementioned strategies in Avalanche. We have a few of them that have been not only implemented, but also uh, uh, reproduced as for the previously published papers. Thanks mostly to Andrea here uh, and uh, all the people that contributed to these uh, open source projects. Finally, the third part of the methodologies, let's say, section will be on this idea that I think it's very nice futuristic of hybrid strategies for continual learning. Uh, that is how we can plug and play <laughs> these different um, uh, approaches and build uh, very cool and even effective, efficient strategy that would mix these ideas. Uh, 
I think this is fundamental. Uh, will be mostly the future in terms of practical impact of continual learning. Uh, we already seen um, starting this trend, and uh, and uh, I think we we see more and more hybrid strategies over time. Uh, and we have also a couple of evidence from nature that this is uh, definitely the right way to go in a sense, uh, as it is known that uh, from biological evidence that the brain uses many of these approaches to learn continually. Architecture, let's say, building new synapses over time, uh, but also uh, re, re say, strengthening these synapses based on different uh, experiences or maybe um, um, uh, specific, let's say, uh, emotional um, um, situations or uh, we, we also have a notion of replay, for example, what happens uh, during dreams and, and uh, how we can build more robust knowledge uh, just by replaying um, uh, particular memories. Um, then we're going to see again how to implement hybrid strategies in Avalanche. And uh, the second part instead of this lecture will be dedicated to application, possible applications of continuous learning. I will try to, to to have a summary here, what we have seen so far, so nice real world applications of continual learning we've seen already today. Uh, then, uh, then what's 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 imminent right now, and even what, what I think would be very interesting for the future. And and just as a, as a quick notice here, and, uh, and uh, something I can anticipate, I believe that continual learning is going to be not just uh, useful for a couple of applications, but it's going to be pervasive in a sense to every possible machine learning. Uh, systems out there. Uh, we will discuss about why, but uh, and then, then you you can uh, think about this and you can uh, tell me if you agree with me or not. Uh, and then I want to conclude with just giving a few uh, hints on uh, what what's, what they think are relevant tools that you can use apart from Avalanche for uh, building continual learning algorithms, apply them to the real world, start thinking about uh, business ventures or other things uh, about these, these relevant areas. So the best of what you can think and you can find in, in continual learning tools and services out there. And, uh, and so I think that's relevant for a continual learner like yourself. <laughs> um, OK, and then we will finish uh, the uh, this lecture um, series uh, with the frontiers uh, uh, in machine learning where we are going to discuss about let's say try to to sum up things try to conclude a bit of uh, like, uh, let's say take home messages that we can uh, even discuss i guess would be nice to have with you guys a uh, brainstorming session about this uh, and um, look at pro promising future direction for continual learning um, um, and uh, and i think that then we where we can focus on two i think relevant uh, areas that I really like to investigate nowadays in my research activities and thanks to all the people that though, uh, are within the, the, the pileup we're going to discuss later. Uh, but essentially looking at uh, continual distributed learning, so the intersection of distributed and continual learning, and uh, on the other hand, looking at continual learning in, in, a, in a world in which patterns are set. Uh, as you know, in the, in the real world, we are, we are subject to this streaming stream of, of, of data uh, that are that have structure indeed in time. And so we should leverage, I believe, this structure and move towards systems that are not only able to learn over time, but they can exploit the structure in time of the data, possibly lowering the amount of supervision that we need. Um, and then, uh, as I was mentioning before, we're going to have two lectures, guest lectures from Gada Soker and Guido van de Van. Uh, Gala is going to be, I think, even here for the lecture, so uh, it's going to be in, in prison, uh, in prison, and uh, Guido uh, unfortunately cannot attend here in prison, but uh, he will join us on the big screen here. And uh, the first one is going to talk about addressing a stability plasticity dilemma that we discussed about in the next lecture in rehearsal free, that's it, free play free continual learning. It's very interesting and futuristic, I think. Um, uh, sub, let's say, field uh, area of exploration of continual learning. And then the second one is going to talk about more generative models, these very interesting ideas of uh, uh, adding a uh, um, parametric function that can learn from data and that can generate uh, examples back uh, and uh, use these idea, these ba basic building blocks in, in AI and in machine learning for continual learning. 
uh, and in various ways that Guido will present. Guido is, is one of the, I think, uh, most experienced uh, persons in, in the world, I guess, on, on generative uh, models for continual learning. Uh, and so so we am really excited to, to have him and Gada here talk about their own research agenda. Ah, nice slide here. <laughs> Maybe you can open some uh, some switches. I don't know if that's helpful in terms of uh, uh, maybe it's better, right? <laughs> so that we don't sleep here. Okay, so that's better. I think that uh, uh, the trajectory is uh, near enough so that we can see uh, the content as well. All right. Uh, I don't know. Can you see maybe you the bottom? Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. So um, here, I just uh, uh, show you uh, guys and girls. Um, where you can find on the course.continuai.org website uh, the material. So, so for each lecture, for example, I just I j already put the slides uh, in the corresponding lectures of today. So if you go there, there's an embed link with Google Slides, so you can already watch the slide there. I will uh, put them the slides in each of the lectures separately, but you can already check all the resources of the course that you can see here in the course materials, additional material sections, okay? so. Uh, here, I will try to, to really gather, thanks to Andrea and the other teaching assistants, uh, all the, let's say, uh, materials of the course, so, so maybe you can even download it in the future uh, as a zip file. Okay. Um, then, uh, in terms of useful links, then I promise that we will start with the introduction of continual learning. Uh, 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 just one question. Yep. Uh, if slides can be uploaded all in advance. Like, no, I, I don't think that would be possible because I'm doing them like all, all over time and uh, I need to refine them uh, uh, as we go on. Uh, so I don't think that would be possible. But uh, um, so what, what's nice is that they will be available later on uh, and um, and I make sure that we have both the PDF uh, version and the constantly updated version as Google Slides. OK, uh, then, of course, you have all these recorded material, everything then we will post all the, 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 the material later on. So uh, uh, I think we'll be, uh, just with a bit of patience, I would say you can you can get everything uh, out of this course. Okay, so here I list just a couple of interesting links and projects that we are um, developing mostly at UniP and Continual AI. And then I will start with the, let's say, second uh, part of the lecture that is more about continual learning. <clears throat> And I guess we are pretty much in time. Okay, so um, uh, so so within Continual AI, we started this endeavor trying to have a, a wiki, a wiki style, let's say, single access point website where we gather all the information, all the links and materials about continual learning. So uh, we have the pleasure here to have Andrea as the main, let's say, maintainer of the wiki, <laughs> and. Um, and so uh, I think he is putting a lot of effort into this, and and I am really grateful to this, and and all the people that contributed, a lot of people that contributed as well, uh, but but because it's 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 a way through which you guys, for example, you can just access this website and get access to all this content that is not just created by us, but all the people around the world about continual learning. I think this is awesome, and. Uh, and um, uh, I invite you all to contribute, of course, to, this, uh, to all these projects, actually. They are open source uh, on GitHub, so you can do uh, uh, whatever you want with it. Um, and, and so uh, uh, just, just to mention a big history here. So, so I, when I started with, as a PhD working in continual learning, there, there was like a little, if no, no references and, and knowledge base about continual learning. So it was very difficult to find a way to communicate uh, with other researchers interested in the topics, just find other people that were interested in, in deep continual learning uh, or simply get access to some resources that would kick off, you know, uh, my own research in this area. So I just realized that it was very difficult to do this. And I, and I said, OK, I, I have to do this. So in 2018, I started Continual AI actually as the idea of the Continual AI Wiki. So just as a place where we can have a couple of links <laughs> that people can see and, and uh, and they get access to the, the content that's created. But then I, I realized that could, this could, could have been more and, and then Continual AI was born and so on and so forth. But yes, you can take Continual AI Wiki as a reference to the material of the course. And I think you should really exploit this because people have worked for it. And, and I think if you want and you want to use it to, to, to give back, let's say, to this community, that would be great. Then 
Uh, we have also these related company, let's say, projects in which we list all the possible papers in continuing learning, uh, at least that we know about. And, and this is, I think, a public group on Zotero, so you can really contribute to that if you know a paper that is not listed there. And so the, the additional thing is that we provide a nice interface that you can use to look at different papers tagged, uh, semantically tagged for you. So, for example, you're interested in uh, papers with uh, experiments on MNIST, you can look at the MNIST tag and you can find these papers. So that's not, or maybe papers uh, from 2018 and uh, to 2018. So that's the idea, let's say, then uh, we, we should work more on that, but there already you can see a lot of interesting papers that we use also as the base reference of the course. Okay, so for example, books and uh, surveys we're going to discuss are indeed based also on this collection that we are trying to, to maintain. Uh, then um, we have a continually a Slack workspace that you can join if you want to meet other people, uh, uh, have some fun <laughs> into the different channels. But uh, I don't recommend to use this for the course. For the sake of completeness and um, visibility transparency, I think it would be nicer to instead use the continually AI forum that is a discourse. I don't know if you know the tool, discourse forum platform, like I don't know if you're familiar with PyTorch discussions points. Uh, where that is very nice to, to create articulated discussions about relevant topics about the course. So I've created uh, for all of you a, a section within the course that is called CL course, <laughs> uh, where you can post your questions and you can discuss about relevant issues of each lecture, any issue, technical, uh, about the content, anything, and and you and you can continue the discussions uh, about the, the, the what we what we have uh, seen in the course there. Uh, so I think that's a nice uh, way to stimulate even the community that not, cannot actually follow the course today, might in the future, discuss relevant ideas and uh, have some fun together and <laughs> trying to brainstorm new new ones. Um, OK, so so you can refer to the official website for the course for, and, and the, the forum that try to keep updated also with announcements and some interesting if you follow up, let's say, material course and, and ideas. And you can ask your questions there. We will get to that. Um, then, uh, well, okay, we can skip these. I think uh, we have um, a medium publication, more high-level blog posts that you can uh, check if you don't want to to get to the, the real, let's say, uh, more heavy content of the papers. You can already start just uh, simply looking at the, the medium publication where we have a high-level post about continuing learning. Uh, we have a main list, uh, open main list moderated by the continuing community that you can join. That may be useful. Uh, a newsletter of the continuing AI uh, community. And this is interesting. We, are, we had, actually, we stopped them in favor of the course. A nice uh, series of seminars that we have every week uh, in which we have uh, an invited host that we would talk about a particular paper in continual learning. So that may be useful for you. Maybe if you write something yourself, you can just ping me and we will be very happy to have you if that's related to continual learning. Um, and this is a nice platform as well to showcase and uh, you know disseminate your research, I guess. Um, and then, of course, everything, all, all, so this course is, is uploaded to the main uh, continual AI YouTube, YouTube uh, channel that you can see where we have a lot of material now <laughs> Uh, even the previous workshops we organize and uh, other fun content. Okay, so in terms of the references, um, so this is a not not complete uh, reference of the reviews and books that we're going to use. Again, we don't have the luxury of having a single you know reference book for continual learning, uh, and so we need to. I need to ask all of you a bit of uh, say effort. To try to, to for, for every concept, try to link it to the appropriate uh, publication. So, given that there is no, let's say, very consolidated reference for continual learning. So, here just a list a few of the papers that very, let's say, uh, uh, cited or, or, let's say, known into the community so that you can start from those. But don't be shy and check out the continual learning paper list that I put the link here below in the, in the bottom of the slide so that you can get a better idea on. Uh, <clears throat> on, on uh, what's out there. Uh, but yeah, just to mention, uh, the first reference that I, I really want to make here is the the, the only, let's say, book uh, specifically on lifelong continual learning. Uh, that is this book from uh, um, from Chen and Liu uh, that is called Lifelong Machine Learning. It's a second edition. You can uh, um, uh, see it online. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's the more comprehensive book on continual learning, lifelong learning to date. 
I suggest you to look directly the second edition because in the second edition there is a significant uh, let's say expanded chapter on continual deep learning. Uh, but we're going to see this is uh, even more uh, comprehensive than just the content of this course because it, this course is, is about mostly about deep continual learning. This book is more about general continual learning, even with, with different approaches not related to gradient uh, descent uh, neural networks. Okay. Um, Okay, then final note is I think we can go towards uh, the, the, the content. Uh, sorry if that was a bit boring. Uh, uh, if you have any problem with the slides, the website, the modality, you can contact directly me uh, via my official email, no problem. Uh, if it's an avalanche related project uh, problem, uh, please, please use directly the channels related to the avalanche issues and discussions directly on GitHub. So if you go on GitHub on Avalanche, uh, if you have a technical question about it, you can use the discussion page. We have a Q&A section within discussions and a tab on GitHub is called discussions uh, that you can use and uh, you can already see already, let's say, some interesting issues and discussions there. Uh, then we have the issues tab in, uh, in the Avalanche uh, repository that you can use if you really found an issue related to avalanche, hmm? uh, so a non a not expected behavior. Before posting an issue, please look at the many different issues that are already open there, okay? It's just a, a reasonable, let's say, um, common behavior for open source development. And uh, so check if the issue related to the same problem already exists. If the, it doesn't exist, we're really happy to have an additional issue open. Then if it's uh, you have a more, let's say, content-related continual learning question, I don't know, for example, is, is a replay uh, an interesting strategy for bioinformatics? I don't know, anything. Uh, uh, then you can, I think that this is useful uh, to post on the continual AI forum because the other people can see it. So the, 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 the answer that I will give is not something that uh, stays between us, but it's something that all the community, all the other people from the course can enjoy, okay? So we're gonna use the continual AI forum and uh, me, Antonio, Andrea, and teaching assistants will help us in, uh, and possibly other people from Continua AI will help us uh, discuss about these questions. Okay, so let's start uh, the actual introduction to continual learning. Okay, so as you may know, um, deep learning or state of the art performances in many, many tasks. In computer vision, uh, natural language processing, uh, speech recognition, you name it. Um, and I think this is mostly due to supervised training from huge and fixed data sets collected a priori. So the idea is just to collect a representative set of examples that would nicely represent the problem you would like to model. For example, I have an object, I want to create an object recognizer, I just collect a bunch of examples in all the different poses, scale, occlusions, uh, different variations in the background environment, everything of a set of objects I want to recognize. I collect all these different examples, I train my system on it, and then I hope to get uh, a good accuracy on the test set, right? So this is the way we would do, we'd operate in a, in a machine learning system. But what, what I want to convince you about is that as we grow in terms of uh, uh, complexity of the problem we'd like to model, and hence, I believe, in terms of uh, high dimensionality of the problem, then it becomes exponentially harder to collect a set of representative examples for the problem. And so, so this, is also, this is known in literature as the curse of dimensionality. So as you grow in terms of dimensions and the complexity of the problem grows, it's very difficult to cover this entire huge space of possibilities with a set of examples that were represented well. Uh, um, so this is just, this is not a big number here, uh, probably grossly wrong, right? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a big number uh, that would show the, the total possible net, uh, images that you can get out of a 227 times 227 uh, times three depth in channels, RGB, this is a, like a, if you look at it in, in a screen, it's like this patch of, of image, like a very small image, uh, and, and this is the number of possible images. So you can see that the, the space is huge, even though 
we have, uh, let's say, some, let's say, a part of this space is like random noise, not not natural images, right? But it's still huge, and so we expect actually to recognize objects, for example, in the famous ImageNet uh, data set, just based on one million examples, that just one million over these huge numbers, right? So, so we are making like a, a leap of faith here, and what I want to show you with a couple of examples is that no matter. Uh, how we 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 stress our boss uh, in, in a business uh, application that we need more examples. We're going to have just a fixed number of, of examples, and what we end up with is a model that is biased by definition. So there's also a common say in statistics that all models are wrong, right? Uh, so with this idea that uh, you cannot have a perfect model, and uh, as you grow in terms of dimensionality, this is this is something that you can easily grasp, and and uh, and, and your assumptions are really biased. For example, here um, we say we, we see four images that uh, are synthetically generated and maximize the response of a neural network for a pre-trained state of the art on image net or the million images that uh, maximize the response of a neural network on the barbell class. Hmm? So these weights uh, that you use at the, the gym. Um, and as you can see, the network has a very biased understanding about the, the concept of a barbell, which includes also visual cues from a person arms. So it, it, it is clear from the images that we have collected just uh, not enough you know, examples to generalize the concept of a barbell well enough, because all the images, all the examples we collect are eventually, in this case, linked to the presence of a person arm. Uh, and this is just a, a, an example, but I think even more uh, nicely, uh, this is described by this uh, captioning task where uh, you know this uh, this scene of a flooding is described by a group of people standing on top of a beach, <laughs> and 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 even in this case we have not collected enough information, enough in this case tuples, uh, you know description images that would represent the particular subspace of images captions of a flooding. Uh, so 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 what I I'm trying to argue here is that no matter uh, uh, you know um, uh, as, as you you you. you your efforts in trying to come up with a representative set of examples, if you take all these kind of problems, very huge, you can end up with a, with a, with a, with a model that is uh, working well and is not prone to catastrophic failures <laughs> uh, sometimes. So that's that's my main argument. And so uh, how we can then uh, improve AI effectiveness and even efficiency, scalability, and adaptability to circumstances that we have never seen before. So we don't fail into this, uh, I would say, arrogance of uh, uh, believing that we can come up for a complex problem with a perfect model of the world, right? And we instead move towards this idea of having a methodology that is able to fix faster, uh, you know, eventual failures of the system. So that's a much better approach. Like, it's like in security, we're not saying that, uh, you know, in, in computer security, you have a system that is perfect, that is, 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 is able to face all possible attacks. But you say that you have a nice, uh, quick patching protocol that will help you in quickly respond uh, to attacks in cyber informatics. And the same is the same concept, I think, can be applied to machine learning and is the core idea of continuous learning. So this idea that you can build um, uh, your model over time, you're not, you don't have the assumption to be perfect, uh, but you just have a way to improve over time. Uh, and so more uh, practically what we are saying is that to move away from this very rigid separation of training offline a model and then deploy this model with frozen learning capabilities that we are moving towards this smoother way of learning where we constantly update our biased understanding about the external world, uh, uh, always improving over time. And uh, uh, this is the important point. We explore these huge space of possibilities only locally and when we need it. So you, you see that uh, we are not trying to solve the world, to save the world, right? <laughs> but we are just trying a way to say, okay, now I need this piece of knowledge. Let's acquire it in a fast, efficient way. I think this is more, much more sustainable and going towards uh, an idea of sustainable AI that is more adaptive and less subject, more robust, more autonomous, less subject to catastrophic failures. And practically speaking, this means that we want to learn a particular mapping function, our neural network f of theta from the x1 to the y1 distribution, uh, uh, starting from a couple of examples, this case in a supervised learning case from uh, you know x and y's, uh, for example, images uh, of a particular object, set of objects, and then uh, labels related to these objects. Then, as we encounter another couple of distribution, sub-distribution, maybe to the problem we would like to face, then we would like to generalize this mapping uh, to 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 handle both distributions, but possibly without accessing anymore the examples 
related to the X1 and the Y1 distribution. So this is the concept of feeding the same model over time with new examples gathered, and we were going to be more formal about this in a, in a minute, but don't worry, but that's the main idea. And uh, the goal that is driving many of us researchers in continual learning is to uh, go towards this idea of having systems that can reason on a higher, uh, more realistic time scale, where data and tasks became available only during time. Uh, so we have this strong notion that uh, time is not just uh, um, acknowledging the fact that uh, data points can have, like, uh, can be constructed in time. They have these time attributes, like sequences. But we also saying that we have available examples only during time. We can have this assumption of having all the representative examples all at once to model the problem, like we are we are we are doing nicely when we we play cards, you know, with a friend, and, and everything is on the table and everything is clear. Unfortunately, that's not the case for the real world, and and so we we need to acquire. Let's say we need to acknowledge the fact that the world is non-stationary and is changing over time. Well, one can say that uh, this is uh, often. Uh, Mechanicistic, let's say, philosophical assumption, and you know, Pascal was saying that uh, if you, if you could uh, take all the variables of this world, this universe, all into your accountability, then you would, you could create like a static uh, oracle that would solve everything, right? But if we get you, you know, you assume that the universe is indeed uh, self expanding and is changing over time, well, then in that case, we need continual learning, even even uh, for for. Or theoretically, not just practically, for improved efficiency and, and reasonableness of, of our systems. Uh, then one of the, the main assumptions is, is often made within continual learning, but not always, is this idea that you want to, uh, you know, uh, not memorize all the data you encounter so far. So, so this is of course linked to more efficient, uh, you know, solutions, both in terms of computations and memory. As you may imagine, you just process the examples that you have uh, under your nose. And then once you finish processing this example, you can get rid of them. And this is very in line with this idea of a biological learning systems as well, right? That uh, act on the world as filters rather than, you know, accumulating all these noisy data and redundant data from the world. We just try to summarize it and to filter it and to condense it in our brain. <laughs> and we, it's, it's very unlikely that we store high dimensional patterns in our, in our mind, right? And in our brain. Uh, so that's the idea, move towards that, that vision uh, of uh, filters that can uh, quickly gather knowledge and build this knowledge incrementally over time uh, in an efficient and scalable way. And I think that, again, this notion of efficiency scalability uh, brings us to the notion of sustainability. And uh, this is something we discussed uh, in a recent paper we published, uh, uh, this called Sustainable Artificial Intelligence Through Continue Learning, where we see Continue learning as a mean towards the, the end, right? The, uh, an effective mean for um, uh, allowing a system to be more sustainable. Uh, so that's a very interesting take, I think. Uh, and then the force, uh, better evidence, and then the discussions will be made. But I think that continue learning should re a community should really push into the, these directions. And um, and and and, and uh, I'm really excited to hear your thoughts about this. Maybe you can discuss at the end end of the lecture. Uh, one of the uh, main reasons uh, why uh, continual learning is very, very interesting and fun in, in uh, with deep learning is that uh, neural networks suffer from what is known in literature as the catastrophic forget catastrophic forgetting or interference phenomena, uh, where uh, uh, we can describe it as as the tendency of artificial neural networks to completely and abruptly forget previously learned knowledge, information upon learning new information. And this is, in, let's say, directly connected to the way we train our systems. So they are often trained with gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so this idea that as soon as you spend a couple of, of iterations, it is an interpretive method, uh, I recall you all, uh, towards a particular, let's say, local goal described by the loss function on the, the current training set, the current set of examples we are processing, then we completely erase the information encoded in our parameters related to the to the, 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 the tasks or the knowledge, uh, the examples in general, the, the data distributions we have encountered before. Uh, and, and we will see more these in more details in the next lecture. So you, you really don't worry, you will get a very clear understanding of what forgetting is, even in practical terms. Uh, but here just wanted to show you uh, uh, just a plot from a recent uh, nice survey published in one of the, the top venue for machine learning and AI, 
uh, journals, that is the, the, the uh, transactions of pattern analysis and machine intelligence, that will also give you an hint on, on how continuous learning is evolving indeed in, 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 quickly as a mainstream topic within machine learning. Uh, you're just showing that uh, if you don't uh, have a particular heuristic strategy to tame forgetting, this is really catastrophic. In a sense, you're just able to learn new things that you see uh, at the current step in time, and you forget completely about uh, previous knowledge. So you, you just are not able to, to be more effective than random guess of what you have uh, already learned and acquired before, uh, unfortunately. And here, um, yeah, um, I don't think it, it's uh, worth uh, looking more into these uh, these plots uh, more in details, but uh, as you process a number of, of uh, tasks, in this case 10, uh, this uh, uh, fine-tuning, let's say, naive approach of just continued backpropagation on the current set of examples you encounter over time is, is completely failing and subject to catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so here uh, we just see the accuracy of the first task uh, uh, once we learn in a sequence all the 10 tasks. So while uh, for the first task, as soon as after we have learned it, we can achieve a performance of more than 50% in accuracy, you can see that when we learn uh, the task two, the accuracy of the task uh, one drops catastrophically down here below random chances. Uh, so, so this is an example, and then it is not able to recall in any way from this uh, very ugly performance. So this is just an example on how uh, you know catastrophic forgetting is really impact the impacting well, real world in this case. Um, classification tasks uh, uh, in, in, uh, in object recognition, I believe it was taken this, uh, this plot. Then what I want to stress here is that um, continuous learning is not just an, a nice feature you can build on top of your machine learning system, your AI system, but I... Do we have some questions? No, okay, because I because I hear some noise um, from the audience. Okay, so you, you can mute yourself at home, uh, or you can ask your question. I think it's better if you ask your questions uh, directly to the chat, then Andrea will report them to me. Um, but yes, um, my thought here was mostly that. Um, so so you you can see continue learning as just a way to handle you know shifting distributions or okay, and uh, let your application. Uh, work with a stream of data, right? Uh, but I think that continual learning can, and we already a bit uh, um, let's say hinted about this before, can be seen as a fundamental, let's say, paradigm changing uh, approach and vision uh, for machine learning. Because what we are doing here is essentially um, removing the, 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 the main assumption in statistical machine learning. It is the idea that you have uh, uh, an NAD sampling of the uh, distribution that you would like to model. In general, and th these distributions are mostly fixed in terms of you know, they are stationary, um, and and this is something that has been, of course, uh, constrained in, in the first, let's say, explorations of machine learning up to date with uh, nice uh, theoretical uh, guarantees and practical advantages. But I think it's is becoming now more and more the case that we start to embrace a more complex, let's say, way of doing learning in a stationary environments. Um, and uh, so I think that Hava Siegelman, that was um, um, is, a, is a very well known professor uh, and was the um, main director of um, a well funded DARPA uh, program on lifelong learning, one of the first in history, uh, uh, was saying that we are not actually in, in looking for incremental improvements in state of the art and AI neural networks, but rather parting changing approaches to machine learning that will enable systems to continuously improve based on experience. So this is just um, just a, a, a stressing point that uh, I think continuous learning may be posed to be more uh, of a pervasive, let's say, new approach to machine learning that rather than a nice extension and uh, subfield, you know, that some researchers take care of. Uh, and then you can patch back into your own uh, Frankenstein AI system. <laughs> um, then uh, going towards a more, let's say, strict definition of continual learning, um, um, but still trying to be general enough to cover what's been proposed so far within the deep learning realm and even before, I think that 
we can see uh, the continuous learning problem as um, as uh, even in, in the more general terms uh, of the definition of machine learning from Tom, right? Uh, so this idea that you uh, you call a system that is able to learn autonomously, a uh, program that is able to learn autonomously, uh, autonomously from, from experience, a program that uh, uh, given a, a set of those experiences um, is able to improve on a defined uh, metric, uh, performance metric that would um, represent well the task that you want to solve. So we, we are currently, kind of, uh, we're not moving actually from this definition of machine learning in continual learning. Uh, the only thing that we impose here is that we encounter these experiences over time and we have access to them only over time and we cannot access all of them at the same time. <laughs> so uh, we encounter a sequence of experiences, E0, E1, EN, with N can be unlimited, so uh, infinite possibly and and so that's the main uh, difference right so these experiences may be even ephemeral in a sense so we they can disappear or maybe we don't have access anymore to this data and what we want to do is to process each example is experience this package of data you can think of it as a package of data whatever they may contain uh, that we need to process we can process uh, one at a time so this is the main assumption of continual learning uh, in terms especially uh, uh, on the constraints of on the data streams and uh, the content of each experience e of i can uh, can be different uh, right for example in a classific simple classification problem supervised maybe just um, a set of x like images examples of these images uh, a set of y so the targets that we would like to um, uh, say the labels of these uh, examples and then maybe even an additional supervised signals telling you what kind of tasks you're solving, from which data distributions these, uh, these examples are coming from, additional um, uh, evidence, supervised signals that would help us learn better in continual learning. Uh, and so an example of this may be, for example, um, we're going to see this in the next lecture adding um, a standard and NIST data set in which we encounter just a couple of classes in time. So for each experience, you have different classes you want to uh, recognize, learn how to recognize and distinguish. And we treat those as just separate, separate tasks, right? So uh, we have an oracle telling us, uh, for example, that uh, now you want to uh, resolve this particular task. They're just recognizing if it is a zero or a one, then you are in a different task and you want to recognize if this is, if this is a two or a three and so on and so forth. Or maybe you can have just a notion of one task the single task of just recognizing one of the digits across all the possible 10 digits. You can have everything. So you don't need to worry if you don't uh, really get a particular paper, you know, that is safe. Yeah, you're doing these assumptions, these other, because I see a lot of PhD students in, in trouble here saying, okay, hello, maybe I, I'm trying, I'm not understanding what, what, what they are doing. No worries. I mean, uh, in continuous learning, you have just a, the, 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 the say common assumptions that you have a stream of experiences and you can get anything out of them, <laughs> actually. And based on those, you can have different uh, use cases, scenarios. All of, the, all of them are be interesting. Uh, but yes, for now, you just need to understand that uh, you need uh, to process in continuous learning just a stream of experiences, these nice packages of data over time. And you don't have access uh, of the E. Um, uh, I minus one and, and still I zero when you're processing the AI uh, experience. And of course, you don't have access to the future experiences. And uh, just I want to stress here that uh, um, the examples may be themselves uh, sequences, right? So we're not saying that each example is, uh, is uh, um, say, uh, uh, an image or a particular <coughs> snapshot in time. These examples may be sequences as well. So this is completely orthogonal with respect to the to the uh, kind of data you're processing. Uh, of course, you may have situations in which for each experience, you have a different image, maybe correlated in time, uh, but this is completely flexible and up to the design, let's say, of the continual learning algorithm and the, the, the benchmark. So don't worry about it. You, you just think that these examples may be also sequences as well. So this is a way, for example, that we, we've used in the past to model, uh, our, let's say, a sequence learning problem. For example, trying to see I don't know if you can see this in the slides, but essentially you have a single video stream of a single object moving in front of the camera and you want to classify uh, this object based on the sequence rather than uh, just on the simple image. Of course, this will be easier, right? Because you get 
more, uh, let's say, visual cues over time of an object may be occluded, may be, you know, in different conditions. So it is reasonable that you can get a better accuracy out of a, a stream of coherent, let's say, uh, data. Okay, so going towards a bit more of, more of a formal definition of continual learning, uh, this is still very much debated into the community, so you, you take this as a grain of salt. Um, this is something we try to, de to define in the paper you can see below, continual learning for robotics, but it's actually a, a, a more comprehensive say, effort to try also to, to map continual learning existing work uh, in a unifying uh, view. Um, and in this um, endeavor, so we, we try to, to define um, continual learning as uh, learning a mapping function. Um, in this case, we call it ACL. Uh, sorry, sorry, a mapping function is F of I of CL. And what we have is a continual learning algorithm that is able to update this model over time based on the availability of new experiences that we encounter over time, right? So we formally we have a stream of uh, experiences. This package is containing X, Y, T, whatever they have, uh, N, and uh, being uh, limited or uh, finite, finite in, in the examples that we're going to see in uh, the benchmarks. Uh, but then uh, for each experience, we can say that we have access to a particular uh, set of examples in the classic supervised learning case, X and Y, a K number of it. Uh, so you can have also different number of examples for each of the experiences, of course. Um, and then uh, it is reasonable we are going to discuss this in the lecture, but the evaluation that you have also access to, let's say, two different sets, one of the for, for the training and one for the test, just to stick, let's say, to the common way of evaluating machine learning systems. Um, and then if you have access for each experience to this set of, uh, of data sets, uh, these data sets, these different sets of examples, then you can define the ACL algorithm as just, a, this is the main signature of the algorithm, as a way to update the mapping function f of theta, that is in this case is called f i uh, minus one of the previous iteration, updated to the current, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say hypothesis f of i c l, based on the training examples belonging to the, the uh, train of i. So the actual training examples that you get into the each experience, the exp oh, sorry, the experience that you are processing at the current step E. I, sorry. Um, then you have a couple more, uh, um, let's say, um, um, parameters. Let's say here in in the in the signature, because um, not because you really need them, but because yeah, I think it's easier if we, um, let's say, detail this formalism this way to. Uh, better ex um, explicit, let's say, the different assumptions that different algorithms are making uh, to this moment, at least in, in the current research uh, and the literature in, in continual learning. Uh, the first one being uh, the memory, so an external memory in which we are allowed to store data structures of any types. It can be examples recovered from the previous, um, let's say, experiences. It can be activations. Uh, of our, uh, I don't know, um, mapping function, our model up to a certain point can be anything, importance values related to particular uh, weights, parameters of, of the model. Uh, anything that would be useful for, for making our continual learning process faster and more effective. Uh, and then we have the actual T label related eventually to the, to the um, to the experience that, yeah, if, you, if, we, <laughs> if we have access to to that uh, for uh, uh, a particular experience. Uh, then if we stick with this notation. Vincenzo, we have a couple of questions, maybe. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Uh, so the first uh, is from the bottom, uh, was uh, what is the difference between experience and task? Mm. So I think this is a, <laughs> a debate. And maybe you can take also the, uh, the next one. Yeah. Mohamed, is the, the stream of experience e? E of I in the in the stream are the episodes of a single task mm. or experiences belonging to different tasks. So I, it, it, both questions, I guess, are related to the notion of tasks that I really would like to destroy in continual, <laughs> continual learning. So no, the, the idea that uh, so the problem with the notion of tasks is that it's really, really fuzzy and uh, it's based on the notion of the uh, it's complex because 
can be seen as the notion of the designer of the benchmarks. So the one that is actually saying, oh, I want the algorithm to, 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 to recognize that this is a task. So it is a notion. Or maybe a notion related to the data distribution. I don't know, maybe this is common assumption actually. So that, that we say, okay, so if this data distribution is, a, is a stationary and uh, then, then I say that this is a task. Or maybe for some other people, researchers, um, just the notion of having separate, you know, experiences. Right? For every experience, we have a different task. Even if they are identical, they are sampled for the same distribution. And then there is another interpretation: it is uh, that the, that the task is what the agent sees. So the the task is is what the agent is given through the task label. So if you don't give any, any task information, then I, I think this is the same task. It's just the task of solving, uh, you know, the world <laughs> and and, uh, and learning over these examples. I mean, differently anything. Uh, because, because again, you, you don't really have uh, the, the algorithm itself. It doesn't have access to the, uh, let's say, um, complete, let's say, loss function of all the all the experience that we're going to define now. Oh, but yes, um, then uh, it, it is also reasonable, I think, uh, coming back to the question themselves, uh, that. Uh, for some scenarios, you can have uh, a, a one on one mapping between experiences and tasks. OK, and this is uh, mostly uh, possible when you have uh, so a finite number of experiences, the n, and then for each n, t of i here is different. So you, you encounter different tasks over time and you get explicit notion even to the agent that you're solving a different task. Uh, so this may be an example. So uh, unfortunately, there's no let's say shared understanding about you know uh, not understanding. I mean, um, a formalism due to what is a task and in continual learning. But I guess that the common assumption is uh, is that um, they, they are just something that you would like the agent to learn <laughs> and to and to able to solve. So this is the most general possible way of defining a task. Uh, just look at the specific formalism within each paper to see what the authors mean when they say task. Uh, I, I wanted in this framework to talk about experiences really to uh, remove a bit of, um, of um, possible misunderstandings, right? Uh, because in some cases, this is not, it is indeed not clear uh, what's, what's the mapping. And if you call them tasks, then it may create a bit of confusion. I think it is just reasonable to say, okay, well, we have a set of, uh, let's say, package uh, set of examples and the only, with the only notion of saying, Okay, uh, you need to process this example uh, in, in one shot. We're gonna we're gonna discuss this better in the scenario and benchmarks lecture. Uh, no, 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 no worries. Uh, you see what are the current uh, let's say assumptions in, in continual learning. Uh, then, uh, so I think I, I answered to, to both questions somehow. Uh, well, let me know, Andre, if, if there are more questions. Um, but essentially, what I wanted to. To look here for the let's say, objective of continual learning, a reasonable uh, definition of objective of continual learning can be uh, a loss, a loss computed um, over, let's say, uh, all the, the sum of all the possible losses on all the experiences. So, so the idea is that uh, uh, we we may say that the objective of continual learning is reduce, um, I say, to minimize the loss uh, on the overall stream of experiences that we encounter on the related test sets. Um, so, um, if uh, we define as L of X uh, the particular uh, loss function for a particular experience, for example, cross entropy loss function, one of the standard uh, loss functions for classification tasks, uh, then uh, we compute these loss functions of all the um, examples, uh, of course, using the latest version of the model that we have so far, so F of N for uh, a particular step in time. Uh, and um, comparing these for, with the labels, or if you're in an enforcement learning case, you, you may think, uh, you know, a more complex loss function based on the rewards. Uh, but essentially, uh, defining all the loss functions uh, for each experience is enough then to describe, let's say, the objective of uh, continual learning over the entire stream, as just as a sum of the whole uh, loss functions that we can encounter. So the idea is to minimize uh, or these overall uh, losses, uh, with the problem being that we don't have access nor to the, to the, the test set, of course, and nor uh, to the uh, the, the data sets, the, 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 the examples, training examples of all the experiences in the past and in the, in the future. Uh, so we need to find a way to approximate somehow this loss function uh, and, uh, and, um, and try to um, uh, update our model f of n at step n uh, cl uh, 
trying to not, not defeat the purpose of the previous those functions. There are many ways we'll see how we can approximate this function uh, later on in the methodologies uh, part of the course. But just I want to mention here a couple of desiderata that are often considered in continual learning. Uh, this is not shared, so many researchers may may say that is uh, they, they they like to to pursue let's say different objectives and uh, different desiderata. But at least uh, from what I can gouge from my experience in the community, we um, um, we we are pretty much aligned with this idea of of moving from replay that is the most effective way of doing learning. Uh, that is storing examples and using them from rehearsal, simulating somehow an ID distribution over learning. And uh, and move away from this a bit, uh, let's say, cheating, uh, if I can say, um, approach uh, towards something that is as a more principle, I guess, not a bit more biologically grounded, inspired. Because you are not storing, uh, let's say, raw data from from the from the environment. Um, then this idea that we should try to, to develop methodologies that are bounded in terms of memory and computation. Uh, so, so in the, in the first, let's say, set of uh, proposal solutions for continuous learning, this was not really a concern. Uh, so people were trying just to get to the point of having the maximum level of accuracy, for example, or let's say uh, maximizing the performance at the end of uh, of of, uh, of the stream, right? So if you get the maximum performance and all the tasks, that's it. That's continuous learning. We are solved. It. Uh, but but. Uh, so, so th as I think uh, I hope uh, I have convinced you before, continuous learning is also about efficiency and scalability. So we need to consider these axes as well into the evaluation. We'll see about that. Uh, and so um, a good, let's say, uh, piece of the community is also now looking at strategies that will be bounded in terms of memory computational um, resources we deploy to our system. So this idea that you know, um, maybe you can grow a little in terms of uh, memory that you use in your system. Maybe you can grow in terms of computation that uh, you're allowed to, to to spare. But in the end, you should work within a fixed, you know, a realm of, of resources. There are there are no unlimited resources. So if you have an unlimited stream of data, you should be able to process that as well in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable way, right? Um, so this is a, an, another important desiderata. And so, for example, you cannot just store all the examples we are seen in the experiences in our memory M. Uh, that would a bit defeat the purpose uh, for many reasons we are going to discuss. But but um, essentially, no one is is uh, is killing you if you do. So there there are use cases in continuous learning which this may be also the case. So. Uh, you're invited to explore if, if for your use case memory is not a constraint. There's no reason why you should limit yourself to just store the current examples and uh, get rid of of the rest. If in case you're you're more interested about privacy, for example, the data are ephemeral. You cannot store them because you're on the edge and you don't have a lot of space, uh, or just you want to reduce the number of computations. That it is worth uh, you know uh, assuming that the more data you store. The more uh, computation you're going to need to do rearch, uh, to rearch this knowledge, right? So a bit of waste, waste of computation. Then uh, just a couple or interesting direction lines. Uh, wow, um, uh, we have uh, this idea of um, uh, task-free for continuous learning, where we have a, a kind of a um, less um, of, a, of a supervision imposed through task definitions, task labels, and then this idea of having uh, more of an online continuous learning system that can process data uh, uh, with high frequency that is also in general low uh, amount of examples for each experience possible one for each example uh, experience so the idea that uh, as soon as you get an example you update your model and that's nice right because you're always very uh, let's say update with the with the the examples the observations are coming from the external world so we're not gonna be, gonna be able, I think, to to discuss um, in details. Uh, especially, I think we can skip the nail part here, um, the nomenclature and related parting. Because I wanted to 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 have the you know, to to to, to um, conclude this lecture in in five to ten minutes, uh, as, I, as I see that you're you're, you're all tired. Um, um, so. Uh, First of all, there's no even a consolidated notion of the nomenclature of, around continual learning. Uh, so um, recent trends in uh, continual learning within the deep learning community uh, um, uh, have used the term continual learning to describe uh, you know, the, all these, these, these advancements. Uh, but it, as uh, happens all the time in research, uh, nomenclature is often used um, uh, consistently only within sub-communities. Uh, maybe related to particular conferences, maybe to some particular approaches. Uh, and this is also something that moves in time. 
so uh, as history tells us, uh, that there, um, there's nothing that that it, it's uh, can be uh, completely agree upon. The, there is no uh, at the moment a de facto standard in continuous learning nomenclature. So um, if you ask to to some researchers. Um, uh, what what they think about continuous learning? Some some and and the and if these is differ from incremental or lifelong learning or continuous learning, some of them may say that this is different. Some someone else can say can say that is not. So uh, if you ask me, I think continuous learning nowadays, especially deep learning, has assumed a generalistic notion so that we can assume these names to be you know synonyms. Uh, but if you ask, for example, to Markering, I guess the the, the one of the, oh, the the person that actually coined the term uh, back in in the in the 90s, early 90s, then it would uh, definitely ask for a different interpretation of continual learning, as it's more uh, related to to to, to, to reinforcement learning. So not really uh, like, for example, a, a supervised classification problem. It would say that it's not continual learning. It's, it's lifelong learning. So uh, pay always attention to, to these, these notions and uh, have fun. I mean, it's, this is a, the core interesting aspects of research. That everything is under discussions <laughs> uh, until there it isn't anymore in a, in a few years. Uh, then there is also uh, a, some a question that I, I, I keep uh, uh, get in, 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 in my research, my talks is, uh, the relationship with continual learning with other learning paradigms that indeed have investigated different topics at the intersection that are interesting for continual learning. For example, multitask learning uh, have been traditionally linked to this idea of, uh, of learning across multiple tasks. So you have a, a, a multiple tasks, but the difference here is that you don't have them over time. You have access to them uh, all at the same time, the same assumption of uh, ID sampling. Uh, um, but but for for example, similar to continual learning, you want to reuse knowledge that you build on a task to solve another, to be better at one other another task. There are other interesting um, uh, concepts and intersection with uh, learning to learn, meta learning, uh, transfer learning, and domain adaptation, uh, and online learning. All these communities that work on relevant topics, continual learning, with slightly different notions, ideas, uh, investigations, approaches. So you are invited to check those out and to discuss even in the forum if you're if you're interested um, and and, uh, and and try to to get at least uh, all of us joining the course a common definition that we can use. Uh, but it's not an easy task as you, as you may imagine. Then just to mention a couple of uh, of milestones in continual learning, I think that I mean I have not done a, a complete work here. I'm sorry about that, but I think that these are relevant milestones that have. Um, uh, showcase uh, uh, a constantly increasing, um, I would say constantly increasing uh, interest in machines that can learn continually. Uh, from the very basic uh, notion of, of AI, so if you look at the famous computational intelligence paper of, um, of Turing in the 50, you can already trace back to that some notions of developmental machine learning, right? So this idea that you are a child, that you can learn over time based on experiences. Um, and, and then you can see that all the different AI approaches based on reasoning and forward chaining algorithms that they have leveraged this idea of building knowledge uh, over time. So you have a knowledge base, you can build new knowledge base on these uh, knowledge base and rules uh, that are constantly updated uh, as well as with the new observations. So this is this was actually part of the definition of, uh, of an AI system. In, in the 70s and 80s uh, with expert systems all the time. Uh, then it was also tackled in, in, in neural networks with the, with the uh, groundwork uh, on forgetting by French, Robin and other people in the in the new uh, say, um, uh, wave of interest in the neural networks in the late uh, um, 80s. And then uh, with the sudden, uh, let's say, new interest in uh, kernel machines, it was also thought because especially I think there was a few um, uh, let's say seminar works in trying to make the kernel machines work incrementally, uh, and uh, so that that those are interesting investigations as well. As well, then we have two uh, important milestones. Uh, they continue. Uh, this is very funny in terms of history, right? Because uh, Turn, Sebastian Turn, that I guess you have uh, you have seen in a different uh, um, now. Uh, Business endeavors in AI, and before it was part of the Coursera, and uh, it was a teacher. Uh, and, uh, I don't remember if it was at Stanford, but it was an important figure in AI. And essentially, with the same exact year with uh, with Mark Ring, I think 
uh, he came up with an interesting thesis uh, dissertation on on continual learning. The first one was called continual learning, mostly focused on reinforcement learning. The second one was a more of lifelong learning, the general idea of, of learning within our networks directly uh, when a new task is is, is present. Uh, then we have a couple of, of interesting um, developments of these uh, first, let's say, pioneering works. First one being these uh, the, the concept developed by the same Tom Mitchell, uh, you, you may know, <laughs> uh, as the main author of the famous machine learning book, uh, and the definition we mentioned before about machine learning, that has worked himself on, on continued learning and calling this never-ending learning from 2009. Uh, and producing one of the relevant, most relevant uh, key, I think, uh, milestone that is called this never-ending language learning supervised system that was let run, you know, on a server for uh, for different years, I guess, seven years, accumulating knowledge over time and trying to produce a Frankenstein, you know, approach that would uh, showcase the relevant, uh, interesting ideas in learning continually, you know, a machine that can really learn by itself continually if exposed to the immense knowledge of the web. Uh, and some additional ins from some supervision. And then uh, we have just, I think, from 2016, uh, this new wave of deep continual learning, deep uh, uh, lifelong learning systems. I just put here this uh, 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 date, 2016, because uh, it's um, the, 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 let's say, year in which uh, a really famous and seminal work from DeepMind and Kirkpatrick uh, happened to take place. Uh, yeah, I'm sure some of you have heard of this elastic weight consolidation approach, WC, that is used uh, today consistently as a baseline for other strategies and was very novel, very original at the time, very interesting, and linked to biological developments. Um, and finally, uh, I mean, in parallel, I think that uh, Bing Liu and the deep uh, data mining and uh, and the um, natural language processing community was also developing new strategies uh, around the topic and uh, around the, uh, with the term, let's say, lifelong learning. And so this is why uh, Bing Liu in 2018 published the official, let's say, latest uh, only book on, on continued learning that we can find today. So this is just a couple of, of uh, milestones. Uh, I, I'm sure that I missed some of the most important ones, but uh, for example, the latest one, uh, 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 the last day I heard that um, uh, one of the survey of my colleagues and, and um, um, let's say very strong researchers in this area, uh, um, uh, the survey on continual, uh, deep continual learning um, that I linked in one of these slides uh, has won uh, the best paper award from uh, the Neural Network Networks Journal of uh, whole, the whole year, 2019. So I think that's a real, also a relevant milestone showcasing that um, continual learning is really becoming a mainstream topic uh, that can win like the best paper award in one of the top journals in, in machine learning and AI. And um, um, this is also a plus. I, I guess it should be normalized actually by the number of publications in AI and, and machine learning, but you see the trend here uh, of, of number of papers published at least with these um, keywords in, in, uh, in, the to in the title, I think, I believe. So this is a work from Martin Munt, um, uh, recent work that you can find as a preprint on archive. Okay, so guys, I don't want to stress out anymore with you. With the uh, yeah, well, we can take them. I think that uh, we I can finish this uh, this couple of lecture, and then we can take uh, your questions and people that want to want to leave, they can. They can. Uh, okay, so um, uh, I mean, um, within within the University of Pisa, I want to mention that we we are working. Uh, consistently and uh, massively, I would say, on this topic with a lot of different peoples belonging to the Privacy AI Lab. Um, so you can check out the, the official website of the Privacy AI Lab. Uh, that is a joint, let's say, effort of the CNR and University of Pisa and led uh, beautifully by uh, uh, Davide Baccio and Patrizio Dazzi. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, in topics related to continual learning, you want to know our activities that we're carrying forward, uh, uh, you want to learn more about this idea of privacy AI more in general, you are invited to check out the the, 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 the official website. You, you are invited to collaborate with us at any level. I think we are all pretty much open uh, to collaborations and discussions uh, with all of you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I want to thank all, to all the people that are, uh, let's say, part of the, the, the continual learning subgroup that we are, we are uh, creating within, uh, within the PyLab and we, we keep, let's say, expanding over time with the new people that are, are, let's say, at least working at the intersection of the disciplines that would benefit from continual learning. So thank you all guys if you're attending, uh, if you're here, and uh, uh, we focus on continual learning at the, oh, sorry, um, 
uh, in general uh, with different dimensions that you can see they're listed uh, from large scale computing learning, unsupervised, uh, semi supervised, at the edge, more practical, more theoretical, everything that is related to computing learning is something that we really like. Uh, so, um, thank you so much, guys, for your attention. Uh, um, sorry if I, if I, I don't know, uh, missed a couple of points or um, I couldn't um, go a bit slowly, uh, slower than this. And uh, uh, the next lecture, we we'll uh, discuss again about category forgetting, try to get a, a deeper understanding of it. So you're all invited again to check the, uh, you know, uh, to set up your system, bring your laptop here next time uh, or at home if you want to follow at home. And uh, we can have some fun also with end sound sessions so you don't get tired. So this is, was, was just the only lecture, I, I promise, in which I, 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 I pushed you <laughs> on just uh, talking, but I really wanted this course to be very hands on, very practical. So don't be, uh, don't worry. We will try to have more fun uh, practically next time. So do, do you have some questions? Sorry if I couldn't stop the lecture before. Uh, I, I, I can be here. Of course, even when we stop the, the stream, I will stay here so we can have also a nice chat later on with you guys and girls um, uh, later um, offline. All right. Well, there is one question online. Uh, yep. you the, the topic about the difference between multitask learning and learning. <clears throat> yeah, so if, if you want to um, stress a bit a bit more this concept, I think it's very important indeed. So thanks for the question. So in, in multitask learning, uh, the objective is indeed to learn uh, a set of tasks and to have a single model that can solve them all. So this idea that you don't have to learn a separate model for each task, but you can spare a bit of memory, a bit of parameters, and you can learn a single model that could, you can solve them all. So this is very nice. It's something that was uh, this, um, investigated a lot in the past in machine learning. And uh, the, nice, the nice thing that was shown is that if you do this, you actually improve uh, if, if there is a bit of, let's say, shared, uh, let's say, skills, knowledge that you would need for these tasks, so they share something, then uh, you may improve your ability to solve a particular task with this single model instead of having just one specified model to solve it. Uh, so this is a very cool, uh, actually, uh, um, demonstration, practical demonstration that if you uh, allow your model to learn from multiple tasks, even sometimes if they're not really related, apparently, you can actually improve your ability to solve a specific task. So this gives us a motivation to pursue continued learning from a sense from the, from the idea of just having a single model that can uh, that can uh, um, solve multiple tasks. Uh, then the different assumptions is, first of all, that in standard multitask learning, the set of tasks is fixed, so it's not changing over time. Another assumption is that you have an ID distribution for each of those tasks, so these tasks are fixed in terms of stationarity, so they are, they are they have the set of examples, that the task is fixed, the objective is fixed, the evaluation is fixed, everything is fixed. Uh, and then uh, um, you can process them all at the same time. This is the third assumption in multitask learning, so you don't have access to them in a sequence. Something that is that you have in, uh, in a, say, a multitask setting in continual learning. Okay. So these are the main ideas, uh, and of course you can already see that notion like related to forward transfer knowledge. So the fact that you want to learn something that you want to use the other task has been studied as in multitask learning. You can reuse a lot of ideas related to multitask learning, and there is a lot of, of, of cross um, interesting uh, topics uh, among these two areas. Areas. Okay, and then there is another one uh, from Raul which uh, has been going through the lifelong machine learning book already. Nice. Since. And uh, he asks, uh, uh, the term knowledge base, meta knowledge minor, and knowledge region, mm. which comes across in the book, how they are related mm. and what comes into the picture of the this is very interesting. I, I don't recall exactly how they are used across the book. Uh, I know that uh, Bing Liu and, and his uh, partner uh, Chan uh, build, uh, let's say, the notion of and the definition of continuous learning based on these different uh, building blocks. Um, it would be nice indeed to check how they can be linked to the definition that I have uh, somehow tried to, to, to put together here for the course. Uh, I think that in the end, uh, you can find this mapping and that there is like a like different emphasis 
on what's important for continual learning. For example, this idea of, of having a knowledge base from which you can recover knowledge. Uh, this is interesting uh, to generalize, for example, the idea of uh, maintaining uh, like knowledge that can reuse for future tasks. But uh, for example, if you look at a deep learning world, this would be part of uh, parameters that are already learned within your mapping function, right? So you don't need maybe an explicit notion of this knowledge base, external knowledge base. Um, um, and, and this is also dif dif difficult to do. Uh, crisply, let's say, map into the, the, the different um, formulas. For example, you may say that uh, the memory we have defined in this paradigm is also part of that knowledge base from which you can recover past, uh, say, discoveries, examples, observations. So uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, that split from the book is uh, is nice on, on for, for modeling some aspects of continual learning, but for some others, um, it may be uh, a bit too strict. For example, it enforced what we mentioned before as, as being the notion of tasks. Uh, I think in the book they, they assume that you have a clear, crisp let's say, definition of tasks that you encounter over time. Uh, but yes, I, I, I may be wrong. I, I have to, to, to admit that uh, I have read the book, but I have not uh, had the time to really map to the concept they presented here and are, uh, let's say, commonly used in continual learning. Um, so uh, I don't know, are, are there any more questions? from the online audience. By the way, we are like 120 people online. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, I, I guess that um, uh, you can uh, no problem. You can reason about the you know the the content of this uh, uh, lecture. We, we can start the next lecture just starting with a with a brief Q and A in case you have some uh, direct question you want to ask. Uh, otherwise, um, I will uh, um, thank you so much for your attention uh, today, and I'll meet you uh, directly on Wednesday. Okay, uh, in a couple of days. Thank you so much, and have a nice uh, evening.